hard to separate the guitar and the sax um, in their tone. Um, and, you know, there were almost parts where I had to kind of like rewind in chunks, just like, am I listening to the sax here? Am I listening to the guitar here? But it's great that the sax is just driving everything through. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, it's it, almost spooky though, how often I found my ears being tricked by that. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of places where, you know, the sax and the guitar are playing in the same register or they're playing in unison. And then it kind of splits off to them doing a kind of call and response thing. So, yeah, it's a nice, like, a guitar and sax is, like, a really nice texture and kind of always has and always will be, you know? Um, yeah, nice. It's just Matt thinking about scar bands again. <laughs> I disappeared for a second in my head. There was just a guy in a checkered shirt skanking. It's like that, you know, monkey I, I, symbols. But you know, as soon as you he said guitar and sax goes well together, I knew exactly what you were thinking. Please, can someone film a video of themselves like skanking in seven eight or something? Because if you can do that without falling over, I'll be like blown away. I've been given many a challenge in my life. That is not one that I will pass up. We'll see where we can get to. Uh, but let's move on to Diamond Stuff now. Um, a track name that sounds like it came straight out of one of those articles the Telegraph would publish writing about what rich parents should be looking out for um, in the terms that their kids are texting about. Brad, are you into Diamond Stuff? What the hell is Diamond Stuff? What the hell are they talking about on this album? You know, like really impenetrable, I think, is like, it does sum up a lot of the local themes <laughs> in this. Um, again, it might be me being dense, <laughs> you know, that's definitely a possibility. But I think every time I've tried to listen to the lyrics and draw some like deep meaning from it, I've gone... Let's just talk about the sax solo. <laughs> it would be easier to talk about the sax solo. Um, <laughs> that's generally been my response. Um, nice sounds in this. It sounds kind of like a mandolin or a guitar pitch really close to the bridge when we kick off. Um, talking about natural kind of sounds last week, it's lots of finger noise. Again, it's the proximity effect of something sounding like it's really kind of up close to you. I don't think anything ever really sounds like it's distant on this album, apart from like very certain elements, vocal performances. Um kind of got a bit kind of mixed up in my mind on this one as to whether we were listening to double bass for some parts. Um I think in the intro it sounds like someone kind of playing around with the tuning pegs. To get the bass notes, you've got those like long drawn out like portamentos between notes. Um, so I think there's something going on where someone is like playing a note and then changing it with the tuning. Um, but I think it does drop into some like acoustic bass and like proper string bass at some point throughout this because there's a lovely, fat, warm, round sound um, the bass kind of comes through with. Um, Again, great use of strings here, um, high strings, kind of adding that extra dimension to it. And it drops to kind of some of its more intimate moments here, like you've got a really lonely kind of sounding lead line with just some bass and some kind of wind. I don't know if it's necessarily sax, but some kind of woodwinds going on behind it. Um, this song, the vocals don't come in until around two minutes. <laughs> and I think that is kind of representative of the album. And like I said, impenetrable. I I don't know. I don't know if the vocals do have some deeper meaning, but it's not one I could figure out. It's not something I could fathom. Um, I don't know if they were an afterthought, but it kind of starts feeling that way. What do you make of it, Matt? Because, you know... You are drawn to the vocals, if you said before. Well, let me tell you, um, you know, you're, you're not able to get any deep meaning out of this. Um, yeah, no, I wasn't either. Um, so we're dealing with the potentially non-group vocalist now, but potentially group vocalist still, I think, on this track. Um, 
there's some nice moments. I tell you what you do get. You get the female backing vocals towards the end when everything builds up. Um, it's still hidden, I think, a little bit away um, behind some of the noise. Um, but uh, it's just over the line. On an anthracite field, I am laid out and a diamond drill takes my feet off. Not something that I would be able to figure out a meaning for here but i can sit back and listen to that and just be absolutely stunned um i think by that extra layer that's on top of it um uh, more generally again lyrically not a lot going on i think if i can draw a line back to the press release or something i read elsewhere this is about to be this is supposed to be about a corpse in a diamond mine um, which makes sense, uh, but not Classic something related I, story there, you know. Not something I would pick up, I think, uh, if I was just looking at the lyrics. So if in doubt, Anakin at Taco Bell, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anakin and Taco Bell. <laughs> that was the uh running joke when we were writing our album that whenever I didn't understand something Matt had written, uh it was just Anakin going to Taco Bell. So yeah, Brad, I'm glad you also struggled with trying to work out what that guitar sound was because I, I couldn't tell whether it was picking above the nut or below the bridge. I I, I wasn't quite sure. I, I figured it was below the bridge, that kind of plucked guitar sound. Um, it, it, it was nice, but this is a very long intro kind of sounding thing that's going on here. Um, it's made this almost kind of nearly like... too... Sorry, go. Yeah, you froze up on me for a second. Um, I thought you would be into this track, considering some of the things that you've sent us recently that you've been like, I really like this. Because this gave me like some kind of post-rock vibes, the intro. Um, obviously, like, I'm a massive Mogwai fan. Oh, um, yeah. And like, it gave me some kind of Nordic noir kind of vibes as well, which is a big thing in kind of like drama scoring and kind of film or television music as well coming through so i'm surprised you're not more into this than you actually are and i'll volunteer as well See, the thing I've is written down um a little bit thurston more here as well in terms of the build yeah and you don't have to drink this time because i didn't bring them up but the thing is for me i i you're right i listen to a lot of music like that really enjoy mogwai um not that familiar with their work but i really enjoy them from what i have heard um this week all i've been listening to other than this is things like apparat which is really atmospheric almost kind of you know ambient electronica kind of stuff and i love that kind of film score and stuff me and brad talk about it all the absolute time for me this just lacks atmosphere and that's what I get out of that kind of music. With Thurston Moore, there's always a, there's there's a feeling, and this again I think goes back to that. It just feels like they're teaching me theory constantly. It's just not enough atmosphere or tension or anything really happening for me to really be super into this. Um, I, someone else might hear it and get a lot of atmosphere for it, but but for for me. It just didn't. It's, it's kind of unquanti like uh, you can't quantify that that feeling. I mean, I sent you the song both of you this week, "Goodbye" by Apparat. Um, that has huge amounts of atmosphere for me, and that's why I love that song so much. The way it builds throughout. This is almost four minutes of the same thing with no no real atmosphere feeling. This is um, yeah. I don't know. It just it felt like they were trying to write a post-rock song deliberately and kind of understand the elements but don't understand the feeling or the <sighs> do, you, do you know what i mean it's really yeah. hard to describe what, what i mean there but yeah i think it's it's like the technical know-how doing it by the book but without really understanding the feeling or the vibe behind it and that's kind of how i felt with this song a lot I, will... I know what you. Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. No, no go on that. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say I wrote down the Thurston Moore thing, um, and 
where this track very much differs for me versus you know something uh that we listen to there it, it's it, it, i never get the sense that it's really built to something um so you know again saying that unquantifiable kind of feeling um overall you know i go back and forth whether i like this track or not i think with every listen um I always feel like it's moving towards that eureka moment which could well be there and i'm just too stupid to notice it um but it it's not something that ever really comes to um i i, I don't tend to be intimidated by music that's obviously smarter than me but this track was a rare instance where i felt that because it was almost by its absence in my head and knowing some of the things it was doing i was like there has to be something more here you know well, that's that's exactly it the the payoff in this song or you know the the release isn't until the 4 minute mark and that's where it starts happening and it, it's <laughs> in my opinion and again it is just opinion try not to taste make here as much as possible but it's just not good enough it just doesn't give you that kind of release that you'd get out of a lot of the music that i would listen to in this style um it, you know it it doesn't have this big huge crescendo at the end like a lot of that music does it kind of just peers out for me and i think that's because I, I, I was almost surprised, because when I first started hearing this, I was like, oh, cool, Black Midi are going to do some, you know, some Sonic Youth-style stuff or drink, uh, or some, <laughs> some something similar, you know? But it just never really got there. I'm going to say I'm going to start preemptively drinking on Apparat now as well, yeah. just to prepare myself <laughs> for the coming weeks. Sorry, Brad, go ahead. Yeah, I would um, possibly wholeheartedly disagree with you on this one, both of you, and doesn't happen very often. But yeah, um, I think there are some great moments in this track. I think that it's a very simple, I think, like I said, I think it's mandolin, but it might be guitar played very close to the bridge, but it's so kind of lonely, it's so kind of simple, and it's such a contrast to the rest of what we've kind of heard. Um. And in terms of the builds, we've got like some more Pink Floydy kind of moments where you've got these like big swells. And when the drums come in, you've mentioned four minutes, it might be around that time that the drums come in, but it's like another kind of instance of them shifting gears and it works so well. You've been waiting all this time to see kind of where this track is going to go. And then those drums come in and again, massive shout out to the drums on this album i they just like they just make it for me here um great groove when the drums come in i've put about this track it's so easy to get lost in it um which compared to the rest of the album is a very welcome change um well it's so easy to get lost in as in you can just kind of like zone out and vibe and just kind of let it kind of wash around you. Um, there are definitely tracks on this album where you will get lost, but not necessarily in a pleasant way. Um, I think this is an example of one that you can kind of get lost in in a pleasant way and just let it kind of carry you. I think that is a very fair assessment right there. Um, so moving on to uh, track six. And yeah, we are well past the halfway point of the album when we hit Dethroned. Um, I still kind of feel like this album has yet to really establish itself properly with me um, at this point, or maybe even sort of make an impression on what it's trying to be or do. What do you think when we hit this track, Cam? This for me is what the previous song should have been. There's lots and lots of cool atmosphere going on here. Um, in the intro with the sax and the pads, and then quite quickly into the first verse. Obviously, it's a different style, but it, it has that feel, which is kind of why, on retrospective listens, I was so disappointed with the previous track, because it's like, well, you can create that kind of kind of atmosphere. Obviously, they did a few breaths. <laughs> um, it's probably just a, just a me thing here. But um, yeah, I mean, quite quickly into the first verse, and, and the best moment of groove so far on the album for me. I feel um, the bass and drums never sound better than they do here. That they're, uh, they're just 
it, it's kind of almost incomprehensible how good this drama actually is because it's 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 just beyond anything I could even imagine you being able to do with with just a drum kit. Um, and the and the bass is locked in with it as well, and it's it's incredible. Um, uh, the builds are good, the guitars are good, and the tension building elements um, they're just not like they felt before on this album. They're really really nice here, and it builds really nicely as well um it's not suddenly just in your face um it grows into its chaos which is which is nice because they haven't really done that too much let you kind of adjust before they throw that at you um it has really nice interludes between the sections as well um yeah it's got that killer piano um but halfway through just the kick and i just want to say like the tremolo picked arpeggio kind of thing that's going on um really really nice sounds really good yeah overall i really liked this track and it's the first moment on this album which is a shame where i felt this is a song i actually really like and this is one that i could go back and listen to over and over again yeah i feel like i've mostly been listening to this album this week between the hours of midnight and 1 a.m i think that's when i've been squeezing stuff in for this um but yeah this is a great sound i'm glad you mentioned the sax and the pads here because i put the same thing it's an amazing blend almost sounds like some kind of 80s like really heavy 80s drama kind of sound but it's yeah just a lovely sound um definitely moving away from the dry feel that we've had on the rest of the album like huge reverb on the sax really kind of relaxing intro and then the drums come in and it's like you said another awesome groove here um inspired like really inspiring stuff i think on the drums as well and i think this is an album that i will come back to when i'm stuck on a drum part and I'm like what do the drums need to do here i'll come back and i will kind of shamelessly steal parts from this album and be like this is exactly what it needs um and then at some point it kind of starts kind of referencing or like kind of calling back to and i'm not going to be brave here i'm going to say track three i'll let matt pronounce it if he wants to um the bass line is very reminiscent, the drum groove switches up and then that becomes very reminiscent. Um then we descend into this kind of like really stripped back feel with vocals, bass, some nice single note stuff on the guitar. Um I've not written down anything about the tremolo stuff, so I might need to give it another listen to kind of get that. Um but this is a very proggy kind of song i felt like like things evolve kind of gradually throughout this like riffs never the same way twice they come back and they're always slightly different um bass is sounding like super tight and punchy on this um i think it starts to creep in a few few tracks before but like how tight the band is how tight the bass and the drums are specifically um just works really well some kind of weird processing that comes through on the guitar and the vocals they're like mimicking each other in terms of like effects um mimicking and blending yeah it's not like it's not like something you're not going to expect from this album uh, i don't think you'd know really what to expect at this point but i think it's a very unique song i think there are some absolutely superb superb moments in here um it's another like great masterclass in like building energy building tension building release things like that um yes yeah, great song so track three was chondro malaysia patella I've said that without even looking at it. I was so pleased Thank that you. I practiced this one uh, this week. Um, yeah, and, you know, I think just adding to all of this, um, uh, it, it's quite a long section, but if you'll allow me to indulge, 
this track does probably have my favorite chunk of writing on the whole album on it um lyrically um so on the brink somehow he still thinks today is just a blip the footnote that ends his entry at the center of all self-respecting encyclopedias that face he will not see again will always be with him will never leave will mock him in his sleep remind him um i have no idea who the subject is i have no idea what face will be haunting him but it is so well written effortlessly evoking that all too familiar feeling of never knowing sort of if you're in the good old days until you pass them um i can only assume between the section referencing things like encyclopedias the title dethroned and a few other nods in places that this is the song um it was referenced in the press release that's about a cult leader who's fallen on hard times um that was mentioned there and you know despite bringing forth some of those feelings you can never ask to feel sympathy for the subject um which you know feels very apparent um and you know if it may be that that section is brought up so much more for me by you know the almost triumphant nature of the vocals which covered just about every note on the scale during that excerpt um nothing ever really harmonizes until you have that moment where the vocals and the instruments smooth out over um it's literally just the words make him um and everything lines up perfectly um it, it's so nice so nice really pleasant very well done yeah great i think it's the best song on the album um by a long way for me the, this felt not that it's the same style as schlagenheim but it felt like schlagenheim quality songwriting um which is always an element i really want in a song basically um yeah and i really enjoyed it but that that tremolo picking i'm not sure if it was tremolo picking or not i thought it was but i couldn't really quite tell there, there's some kind of arpeggio going on there but i couldn't really tell what the technique to make it sound the way it did uh it beyond me beyond my capabilities basically i think or maybe not but it, listening wise I, I think i've kind of cottoned on to the bit you mean there is a bit where it does some kind of arpeggio and from memory it sounds like it's kind of sampled rather than like necessarily played like he's played it once and then it's been sampled and like kind of looped again because like the way it comes back in just feels like kind of subtly unnatural but again like obviously in a deliberately effective way there's no way that he couldn't have just played it again but yeah i think i know what you're <laughs> Yes, and it kind of stood out to me because I was like, it kind of feels like you're tremolo picking that, but also at the same time, that's not what tremolo picking exactly sounds like. So um, it makes sense if it was sort of a sample or, or some sort of delay on it or some sort of effect anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, it just really stood out to me, which was a, was a nice moment in the song. I, I'm a sucker for an arpeggio. I love arpeggio in the song. I think more people should use them more often. You need to go listen to some classical, man. <laughs> or just the Stranger Things soundtrack on a loop. <laughs> hey, that rings some bells. Um, Cam, you said that the uh, that Dethroned is you know, probably the best uh, song on the album. Um, to that, I say Hogwash and Balderdash. Um, that's the seventh track on this album uh and you know again we're ripping through it we've already gotten to the penultimate number here uh hogwash and balderdash uh but you know much like a fever dream i'm not sure if we've gotten here really quickly or if we've actually been stuck in cavalcade for months on end um Either way, Hogwash and Balderdash doesn't stick around for as long as some of the other tracks on this album. Um, much punkier in nature than anything else uh, we've come across so far. And surprise, surprise for me, that is a big plus. Who wants to kick off here? I was actually just want to pick up on something Brad said on the last track, and that, that it felt like a musical callback to track three, which I've written down here. 
This feels like a musical callback to track three, which I'm not going to attempt to say. <laughs> this Come felt on, like the callback really... to this song here. Um... <laughs> yeah, at, at, at some point to me, this wow. song at some point to me this album started to feel like it was mirroring itself in a way it feels like someone's drawn a line somewhere and says right we're gonna go kind of back through the motions but we're gonna approach it in a slightly different way and i couldn't ever quite decide on where that line was and definitively enough make an argument in my head but yeah like i said at some point this album to me felt like it was mirroring itself in some way um which I found interesting enough to write down, but not quite interesting enough to go back and figure out exactly where. Well, the, the reason I thought that this track was the musical callback is you've got a lot of the same elements. You've got that kind of stop-start nature with the synthy stabs coming in, which which might not be exactly the same, but it's the same kind of feeling that that, that track three, um, the the name which we won't say, that Matt could only say. Um, Don't even it it felt it. like a lot of the same elements were there. No, I can't even, without looking at it, I can't even remember what it is. Patella? Pa Paella? I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this is what you know, it's why you present this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I would have just started calling it mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell paella or something like that not far um away. yeah might as well be but yeah um yeah you kind of got those discordant stabs going on and there's a bit of calm almost movie soundtrack like feeling to this um again quite noiry um like brad was saying about a previous track and then you know you got back to the fast movement um yeah it's it's it was over before it really <laughs> was, you know, got started for me. It was just kind of like this crazy two-minute song, and then it's it's gone again. But it it just felt like a section of track three was just here you go in the position of track seven. It's really strange. I think this one to me kind of drives me back a bit to track one. Um, in terms of the mix, in terms of definitely the accent i feel like we're back in full-on irish accent territory here um yeah matt you said you hadn't written down that much about the drums but um here the percussion immediately stood out to me um just because of that like kind of weird panning effect um again there's lots of dissonance in this track lots of kind of slightly uncomfortable <laughs> sounding harmony um lots of tritones going on uh, it's kind of playful and it's kind of comical in a way but it's, the harmony makes it feel also very sinister which is a very interesting blend i think i mentioned ai once already tonight um i think in this instance if you fed an ai the rest of this album and then fed it the back catalog of the dead kennedys this is probably the track that comes out the other side um it, it's honestly all a bit holiday in cambodia for me um heavily guitar driven with almost tongue-in-cheek vocals delivering stream of consciousness lyrics over the top I'm not sure I would have expected this from Black Midi, but it really fits. And, you know, for all of that, we still have all the theater of the other tracks on this album so far thrown into a more bite-sized package. Um, I I'm thinking of that brighter middle section, which you're broken out of the guitar being utterly slammed. And then those clean sections of soloed guitar playing a tune that could have fallen out of a chaplain or three stooges film right um guitar part that heralds the closing section sound is one of the hugest sounding moments on the album um and it's joined in by what sounds like a full sy symphony um it's short it's fleeting but it's really wonderful really wonderful um and i guess not the only 
huge sounding part of this song either his his final line um his brain uh the uh, thought submissive that inside grows bold